Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I know we got live people in here. I need to hear you if you are breathing tonight. Good evening, everyone. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. It's so wonderful to see you all here this evening. And I'm here to welcome you to this space. But before I do that, I would like to first introduce myself. My name is Cindy Williams, and I am a civic engagement leader. I have lived in Brockton with my husband for 20 years, and we have two daughters who have graduated from Brockton High. I am a proud member of Restoration Community Church. Yes and where I um, lead in a ministry called RCAM, which stands for Restoration Community Action Ministry. And just a little fun fact about myself, I love to garden, and so I lead in a small group that is called Let's Grow Together. Let's Grow Together. Are you guys excited tonight? I mean, like, are you really excited tonight? I'm really excited that you are here this evening. I'm excited about, and I'm really excited, trust me. I'm excited about the candidate forum where you and I get to hear our candidates and the platforms they are campaigning on and why we should vote for them. I'm excited about the questions and responses we will get to ask and hear through our facilitators. And I'm excited about the fact that we can participate with our vote in a community where we're all creating together. So I welcome you to stay engaged throughout the evening and feel free to take some notes on responses to issues that resonate with you. On the behalf of this house, Messiah Baptist Church, Brockton Interfaith Community, and the Civic Engagement Team, we welcome you. We welcome you. We welcome you. Now I'm gonna ask for Maria. She's gonna come to the podium and she's going to share our credentials with you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, we can do better than that. I'm half deaf. I didn't hear everybody. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, we've just been told we're having a, just a little technical difficulties with the interpretation equipment. And so we're going to pause for a few minutes. So just hang on tight. Hang on to something if you have to. Okay, okay we're good to go. My name is Maria Miranda. I am Cape Verdean. I have lived in Brockton for 41 years. I see some familiar faces around here tonight, and I am so happy because I'm a tad nervous, just to let you know. <laughs> I am a mother of three, and I am a grandmother to seven wonderful grandchildren, uh, three girls and four boys. I am a leader at the Bro in the Brockton community, interfaith community. You can tell I'm nervous. I apologize. Right. I am a leader on the immigration team, also, I am a leader on the team that made this event possible, which is the Civic Engagement Team. The Civic Engagement Team is made up of 14 committed leaders inside a larger organization who are committed to changing the perception and energy of voting and voter work to one of power and liberation. We believe that this can be accomplished through deep relationship and education. We do this through events like this one, voter education forums, door knocking, canvassing, and ultimately through candidate forum, 
and get out and vote campaigns. We are a part of a larger organization called Brockton Interfaith Community, founded in 1990, which is a multi-faith, multi-ethnic, nonprofit organization from the greater Brockton. Our mission is to work collaboratively on issues chosen together to promote racial and economic justice through prophetic, faith-rooted community organizing. We advocate at the state level as Massachusetts Communities Action Network and at the national level as Faith in Action. By building power locally through intentional relationships, we aspire to create systems and structures for the purpose of establishing a more equitable and just world. Brockton Interfaith Community is a 501c3. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We do not endorse or support candidates for office, nor do we tell you who to vote for. And now at this time, for a faith reflection. At Brockton Interfaith Community, we believe through our various faith traditions, there is a power that we need to create, the condition of true liberation. We honor all faith and also those who would not subscribe to a faith. We want all to know that as this faith tradition, tradition is being shown, we see each and every one of you and the journey you are on. We honor you in this process. And I would like to invite Minister Annette Thomas and Reverend Dr. Howard to present our faith reflection. And after they have delivered the faith reflection, George Angel, it will be coming up here uh, to give us the ground rules, because we, we need grounding. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. It's so nice to see all of you here tonight in this wonderful church, Messiah. I'm glad we were able to be the host for this exciting event tonight. And um, I'm here to give uh, my own personal faith reflection. It is my belief, it's not, you know, everyone have a different uh, belief, everyone have different emotions. But, um, you know, I'm here to share mine this evening. First, I would like to just say, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. One important civic responsibility as citizen is to participate in the political process. Since faith communities do not endorse candidates, the question that comes to mind is, do faith-based entities and faith communities have a role in civic engagement? The answer is yes. But some say and contend that faith and political action and activity must not be mixed which lead to the confusion of how faith ought to influence love and compassion for people who seek a better quality of life. Faith is an implication for our spirituality, which is applicable to every area of living life, including the decision we make on election day. And for this reason, faith-based institutions and faith communities ought to be engaged in social issues and the concerns of the community. It is a matter of faith that leads to the fulfillment of moral and ethical and biblical and spiritual obligation. So what does that mean for faith communities? and faith-based entities. As an individual faith member of the faith community, it is unavoidable for me 
not to prayerfully seek the guidance, the divine guidance and the political process. For me, it is praying for the candidates who are committed to upholding justice and caring for the needs of the people, no matter what zip code they live in. It is addressing important issues like voting, immigration, homelessness, and racial and in social injustices. It is not enough to be concerned and express concerns and will not support candidates and administration that do harm to the people that you and I know, love, and serve. Along with prayer, it is my opinion, faith community have an obligation to equip, to educate, encourage, and provide leadership to voters that they may be informed and have a benevolent heart when they go to the polls. Along with prayer, I believe that it is the obligation for us to be compassionate and caring for all people and not be concerned so much for ourselves. I'm appealing to you to vote for people who do not have a voice. And this is one of the most, I, I would say it's the most important election in my lifetime. And I'm sure it is for many of you. So we have been shown what is good. So what is required of us? Except to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Reverend Dr. Margaret Jean Howard. I am going to briefly talk about the historical journey of Messiah Baptist Church and the Brockton Interfaith Community. Messiah Baptist Church has been a member of the Brockton Interfaith Community since 1990 which means we have been a member of Brockton Interfaith Community for 32 years and counting. Right. Messiah became a member of BIC because we believed in putting our faith into action. Because we have, had already been called to social justice because we are our brothers and sisters keepers. Amen. Big was all about working toward achieving social justice for all of God's people, all of God's people. Faith without works is dead. Right. From the beginning in 1990, Big began to train members of Messiah to become leaders in community organizing. So that, we could, so that we could become powerful network of grassroots leaders that could take on and win real changes in Brockton. Initially, Bix's director trained several members of Messiah in doing one-on-one -on -one meetings, and we used our church roster to increase those one-on-ones drastically so that those leaders, trained leaders, can go out in the communities in Brockton where they live, in the neighborhoods, and get other people to become involved in community 
organizing. Bick was instrumental in suggesting that a local organizing ministry within Messiah be established, which is very active today in 2022. Messiah and Bick have worked on numerous social justice initiatives, which I cannot stand here and, and tell you all of them because my time will be over. <laughs> but some of them include opening city swimming pools, Jeremiah housing, voter registration, public education, hiring of a school superintendent, holding election, elected officials accountable, the Brockton Trust Act for undocumented immigrants, restorative justice, reduction of violence and mass incarceration, hiring more teachers of color in the Brockton public schools, earn sick time initiative, increasing minimum wage for workers, jobs not jail initiative, core training, just to name a few. Messiah and Vic have held many candidates forums at Messiah. Although neither Vic nor Messiah endorses political candidates, we do, however, promote opportunities for people of Brockton to become educated on social justice issues so that they are aware of which candidates they believe will act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God once they're elected. Amen. Then, when informed, educated, registered voters vote, they vote their conscience and not just their pockets or out of ignorance. Messiah Baptist Church remains a vital member of the Brockton Interfaith community, community, and it remains our responsibility to actively participate in community organizing to be a powerful network of grassroots leaders to effectively win real changes in God's public arenas. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. How are we doing tonight? Good. Heard a couple laughs. This is a good crowd tonight. Yeah. All right. So first and foremost, my name is George Angel Barreras. I am a prophetic leader with the Brockton Interfaith Community. And as a first-generation American who, like many of us, I have taken sanctuary here in the city of Brockton, thank you for welcoming me home. I want to welcome all of you as my neighbors, my friends, my family. I am deeply thankful to call this place my home and to call all of you my extended family. Welcome. Please give yourselves a round of applause. So, as we know, with anything involving family, things can get messy. Well. <laughs> So to keep us all in line, in agreement, and in alignment, I have been asked to lay down some ground rules so that all of us can show respect in the space that we are sharing this evening. Is that okay with everyone? That's all right. Thank you. Thank you for your consent and participation. With that being said, I would like to lead us right into our first rule. This rule is referred across the world by many different faith traditions as the golden rule. Rule number one, in honor of the faith tradition whose house we are in tonight, I will read from Matthew 7, 12. Quote, do unto others as you would have done unto you, end quote. This universal rule not only exists in the realm of faith and belief, but also in the world of science. In the West, we might call it an empirical truth. And in the East, we might equally refer to it as karma. That first rule will be our guiding light tonight as we agree to honor this space with respect and a willingness to understand each other. That sound good for a first rule? Yes, sir. Thank you. And to put this in street terms, don't start none, won't be none. 
Rule number two, no food or drinks are allowed in this sanctuary as a sign of respect for our hosts and to each other. We encourage you to step outside to meet your needs, whether it be for the bathroom, refreshments, or whatever food. We will accommodate you. Rule number three, if you are in need of translation, we have Spanish, Haitian Creole, and Cape Verdean Creole translators working around. If you need to raise your hand for translations, please do so. We are willing to support you or step outside. We would also like to limit noise because we want to make sure everyone is able to participate here as an equal. Is that all right with everyone? Yes, sir. All right. Rule number four, please hold your applause as the purpose of this event is to actively listen, not to respond. There will be time to meet with the candidates after this event to review any information discussed here tonight. So rest assured, your time will come. <laughs> Rule number five, this is not a debate. We aren't here to fight, we are here to listen for the purpose of understanding. If you agree or disagree with what you hear tonight, that is your choice to act on that after this event. Our only hope is that this information encourages more participation in local elections and to have an overall more informed population. We are all at our best when we can come together as a collective and learn. Can we all agree on that one? Yeah. All right. No objection so far. Six. Candidates will have two minutes to respond to each question. They were all provided the questions ahead of time. And we will cut you off if you go over your allotted time. Okay. Lastly, our timekeeper is here to keep us all in check. Please give a round of applause to Felicita. <laughs> now, this is not the Apollo Theater. And we will not yank you off stage. But please let us model respect and show respect for all of our time. With all that being said, now that we're in agreement, who are we? Who's out here tonight? Brockton, where are you? Woo! All right, all right, all right. Anyone here from Brockton Public Schools? We got one over here. Hi, Trace. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anyone here from Messiah Baptist Church's congregation? Is there anyone here from Brockton Interfaith Community? Is there anyone here from our mutual aid team? Our immigration team? <laughs> Our civic engagement team who put this all together. Woo! Is there any group I'm missing? I'm sorry? Oh. Hi, Ellie. All right. Friends from Boston. Friends from Boston, how are you? And the NAACP. There we go, there we go, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> How you doing, neighbor? And it looks like we have some of the members of CSJ here as well. So lastly, I just want to give a special heartfelt shout out to Messiah Baptist Church for hosting us. and to the Brockton Interfaith community for uniting us in good faith, in community, and in solidarity. Yeah. And now, I would like to introduce the candidates that will be speaking tonight. Running for state representative for the 9th Plymouth District, we have West Bridgewater in the north half of East Bridgewater, Western Brockton, and some of Northern and Eastern Easton. Representative Jerry Cassidy.
Lawrence Novak. <laughs> Representing the 10th district, we have the Brockton Center of the city, Ward 2 and part of Ward 3 and 7. We have Fred Fontaine. I would also like to welcome Rita Mendez as well. And now running for our state senate in the second Plymouth and Bristol districts in South Randolph, Avon, Brockton, East Bridgewater, Whitman, Halifax, and Hanson, we have Senator Michael Brady. And we also have James Gordon. And last but not least, I'm going to need your patience. They cover a lot of ground here. For District Attorney, representing Abington, Bridgewater, Brockton, Carver, Duxbury, East Bridgewater, Halifax, Hanover, Hanson, Hingham, and Hull, <laughs> Kingston, Lakeville, Marion, Marshfield, Mata Poison? Yeah. 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 Got it, thank you, thank you. Middleborough, Norwell, Pembroke, Plymouth, Plimpton, Rochester, Rockland, Situate, that one. Wareham, West Bridgewater, and Whitman. Solomon. We were not able to secure the attendance of the incumbent district attorney, Timothy Cruz. But without further ado, I would like to welcome candidate Rasan Hall. With that being said, I would like to introduce, once again to the podium, my Auntie Cindy. I'm going to ask if the state representatives can please take a seat up at the table. Uh, we have the 9th Plymouth District and the 10th District. And as they're, take, and as they're taking this seat, I will um, give you a little bit of background on some of their responsibilities to um, our community and for this state. <clears throat> As a mass state representative, they are elected by you and I to represent our interests. We elect or re-elect them every two years. They participate in the legislative process by creating bills that if voted on by other legislators become laws. These bills and laws would represent our needs and interests. They also made changes to existing laws. We made requests, we made requests to them about creating and or changing laws. They debate, amend, and approve the House budget. With the Senate, they can vote to override the governor's veto. They listen to our feedback, concerns, questions, and take action such as drafting and submitting bills, ensuring a bill remains in a particular committee and does not die before it become a law, ensuring funding for programs or services that are important to our, uh, that are important to our community, our state, during the budget process, uh, voting to pass legislation that matters to our community and state, assisting the governor grant a special legislative session to make sure he or she get our needs met. And with that being said, I will now facilitate 
a set of questions that will be addressed to our representatives. And to remind you once again, you will have two minutes, up to two minutes, to respond to the questions. Okay, and I think I'm gonna start, um, I'll start from my, my right. So, uh, Representative Fred Fontaine. We'll start, you will have two, mo two minutes, and then I'm gonna ask that um, Mr. Lawrence Novak, you will proceed after the same question, and so forth and so on, until we end with Rita, okay? Right. Everybody clear? Thank you. Question one, what are the top three priorities as a representative going into the state house? What are your top three priorities, priorities going into the state house regarding the budget or legislation? Let me stand up. Uh, I got to first of all say thank you guys for organizing the night. We will appreciate you. And all of you guys who really want to attend the night, because this is very important tonight uh, for Brockton. Uh, I got to tell you before I answer that question, I don't know if you, all of you know about District 11. District 11 is a district who's brand new. And there's a lot of stake if we do not pay attention. We do need someone who's going to represent that district very well who's been living in that district as well as me. For 30 years, I've been living in Brockton. I represent, without getting the title, District 11. Your question is those three points, which Brockton needs a lot. And Brockton needs a lot of help. I could tell you, safety is first. Infrastructure is the second for me. Brockton is an old city. We need infrastructure. And the, the last one is education. We do have a lot of folks come from everywhere, and District 11 need people, like you did mention, the pastor mentioned it, we have to help them out to understand the city. A lot of newcomers, we have to help them out for the language, not only for that, to know how the city function. If we, do, if we do not do that, in the next 10, 15 years, Brockton will not be, not going to be exist. Since we're going to move away, we need new people coming in. We need to help them out to understand how the system works. Again, thank you. I'm Larry Novak, and my priorities might be different than my brother's. First, Reverend Walker, who used to be the minister here, sends his uh, greetings to everyone. He's now living in Texas with his wife, Paulette. And he's in the financial business, and he wanted me to say hello to everyone. I talked to him this evening before I came. So I send my greetings to you all, he said. Well, my priorities were different. I would like to see the law changed regarding credit unions. When Messiah Baptist Church tried to get city money, it was denied that money because of the law. If we change the law, which is one of the few local banks still left in the city, they would be able to deposit it into this bank. That should be done. It should have been done years ago. It wasn't. I believe and will lead the fight to give senior citizens a tax credit on their real estate taxes. We are one of the few states that doesn't give a substantial tax credit to senior citizens. The goal should be to remain in your homes as long as you can. And to do that would be to reduce the property tax burden. I would favor and lead the charge on that. I believe also that the consumer laws need to be updated. When you call a bank, you're on the phone sometimes for a half hour on your account. I believe that legislation through the Banking Commission could be adopted that requires the banks to get back to you within 12 hours. I think that should be done. It is outrageous for consumers to sit on that phone for all those hours. Those are priorities that I would look at. 
During the foreclosure uh, situation in the city of Brockton, we did nothing. The legislature didn't. We need to review and put that under judicial review. I thank you. My time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much for hosting us. And I just want to uh, do a special shout out to Gene Lawton. Gene Lawton calls me all the time, you know, uh, for, for host, hosting this event. He does a phenomenal uh, job. Uh, I'm Jerry Cassie, a state rep uh, for, since 2016. I've been at the State House since 1987, so I know the workings of the, uh, the State House. My top three priorities uh, since 2016. I've raised, uh, uh, not raised, I've uh, taken in $5.5 million bringing back here to Brockton for earmarks, whether it's uh, the Marvin Hag Hagler statue, there's so many other programs, the prostate cancer awareness, which is very uh, crucial uh, here. The second priority that I have is the behavioral uh, health uh, facility that we have now up on Braymore, uh, the old Braymore. Uh, that was one of my pet issues and we got funding for that. There's going to be a few more things coming down the road that uh, I think uh, uh, is, is very, very crucial. And I'm looking at the time, it's uh, getting close, but um, in uh, parks, recreation, schools, public safety, um, we've had 5,300 bills uh, filed uh, th this session. Not everyone can be passed, but I'd be more than willing to work with everybody that's uh, uh, here in this room. Thank you. Hello everyone, so I'm Rita Mendez and um, I'm currently your council at large. First got elected in 2019, got reelected um, last year and now um, I'm running for this very, very important seat because I um, really want to be able to serve you and bring the state house to the community, have access to the people that language issues is a barrier. Maybe uh, they're going through some um, concerns as they did during COVID, calling me and asking for all these different helps. And then you realize that it's really done at the state level. So that's the number one reason why I decided to run for this um, position. So education is a huge issue. And um, starting with um, the universal pre-K, having access to uh, quality health uh, education to our kids. Um, starting at a very young age because once they come to pre-K, they're already behind some other their kids that already start earlier than them. And also even going up to um, higher education when they start for college, public uh, education, that needs to be more affordable. Because I went to Massasoit and now I'm on the board of the foundation board at Massasoit. And I can tell you there's a lot of kids there at needs that really need more access and funding. Housing is a big issue. We're going to discuss that a little bit later, but I want to tell you that really housing is uh, a key. It need, it's a concern in the city of Brockton and the small businesses, providing support for our small businesses. So I'm a, a member of the Greater Brockton Minority Business Association, and that's what we're doing. They're really providing that support for small businesses because the grants, the loans, the benefits that it's being offered is not coming to our communities, not coming to our businesses, not coming to the people that actually need it every day. So we need to be there to provide that support to them, that liaison, so they uh, know the resources and they get connections, they actually get the benefits. Thank you. Question number two, again starting to my right. We know that at the State House, you wouldn't be the only person voting on legislation. If you wanted to get your priorities passed, what would you do to organize your colleagues together? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, again, before I answer your question, because, you know, I have to say a few words before that. Uh, like you know, folks, you know, um, my name is not on the ballot. When I get elected, when I get elected, so be able to vote for me on November 8th. Because my name, if you see somebody else's name, you're going to have to write my name. This is Fred Fontaine, and you bold that up. Make sure you bold that up. Fred Fontaine, it's easy. 
If you can write, we will have, if you cannot write, we'll have someone to help you out. Fred, F-R-E-D, Fontaine, F-O-N-T-A-I-N-E, and you brought that up. So to answer your question, what you do, first of all, you bring yourself to know your people who surround you, your colleagues who you're going to work with. You have to create friendship first, because you will not be able to work and bring the resources necessary to Brockton if you want to do something about it. So let's say, for instance, uh, I get there. I will have to know my colleagues first and bring them, bring them in to Brockton sometime. Let them visit District 11 to see how, first of all, you got to let you know, you are right in the middle of District 11, that church right here. So look at what it is. So we have to do certain things to help them out. You will show them Legion Parkway. You show them what seven. You show them what to What's the need? And when you show them the need, and you tell them, listen, this is what we're suffering. So you compare your city and theirs, and say, you could do the same for us, because since we are the majority minority in that community, we need help. So when you show them that, they will be able to understand your pain, your sufferings, you know, what you need for Brockton, because Brockton need people who understand, who feel the pain, not because they want to get elected, but because they care. This is what I'm going to do. Thank you. Well, I've always been a strong believer in building coalitions with all kinds of opposition groups. Nobody's going to get 100% of the way. They never do. So you build, when I was on the school committee, you build uh, where you get common ground. That common ground then goes forward and becomes part of the community. I am a strong believer to reaching out to all communities to uh, participate and become involved in the process. Remember, I was the token Republican for years that ever stood up in the city of Brockton. I believe that you stand by your beliefs to the bitter end, but you do not compromise your beliefs. You, you work together for a common good. It's missing in politics today. The common goals are not what we're achieving. I looked at these questions, I, no criticism meant, but with unemployment and inflation at 10% by the Biden administration, and when you look at the world, uh, the foreign policy, you can come to one conclusion. It's a disaster. We used to have the best school system in the state. It is near the bottom now. And Children of color deserve to be near the top. It's something radically wrong with the way government functions. In those things that you go to the polls, you can say, you know, and I don't think Trump was great either at times with his language, but Biden has been a disaster for America. And everybody is going to see that come November. I was in down south in Florida the other day, and I can tell you there's going to be a record turnout in the state of Florida. Um, and you're going to see change uh, again. So, I mean, I believe the change is good. I believe the change should happen at all levels. Thank you. I'm just going to go back to rule number five. It's not a debate. Um, uh, as a longtime uh, staff member at the uh, State House, um, I have fantastic working relationships uh, with everybody. I'm very well respected. The Speaker of the House, uh, I knew him before he was a uh, rep from uh, Quincy. He and I are uh, good and dear friends. Uh, this is how I'd get uh, my, my legislation passed, which I've done in the past. Um, you know, we've had uh, all kinds of uh, different uh, um, uh, members come here to the, to the city of Brockton. Senator Brady and I have hosted many members here. We've held different uh, uh, caucuses and forums here in the uh, city. So we're, we're, we're a very tight-knit group, uh, you know, out of the 130 uh, Democrats that are in members of the, uh, the House, uh, whereas there's 26 or 27 uh, Republicans. But uh, I just want to say I can work with my colleagues to get this legislation done. Getting things passed for the city of Brockton is um, very important. It's crucial. So we have to be able to work together with other um, state representatives, state senators, other legislators at the state house, 
And I'm not waiting until January when I get elected to really get sworn in to start um, building those relationships. So after I won my uh, primary in September, they've been phenomenal. They're calling me, sending me cards, inviting me for um, coffee. So I've been meeting with a lot of them already because when I need something for Brockton, they need to know who we are. They need to understand our concerns, our issues. So it's much better to speak with them now, a friendlier conversation with things that are not as tense as when you get there, it's easier to go to somebody that you have their cell phone number, that you met with them before, that you were able to build up that relationship. So I can't wait until I get sworn in on January 3rd to start building up those relationships. That's going on as we speak. Just this week, I've had um, coffee, and I'm starting locally in Plymouth County and then other parts of the state, but we need to even go across the aisle and, and reach out to the Republicans too and try to work with them, at least be uh, friendly, but I'm leaving them for a little bit later. I'm starting with my fellow Democrats at this point. We'll get to them, <laughs> but it is important, and um, it, it, it's um, we're all there because we were duly elected by the people, so they were elected to their communities, starting with other reps that also like gateway cities that shared some of the concerns and issues for the city that like we have in Brockton, a lot of immigrant minority populations as well. So that is very important. As an attorney, I do have to convince the judge and uh, win my cases and uh, the opposing attorney and counsel. So this is something that I do also in my career and my profession. So. I have no doubt about that, and I'm just looking forward to it. Thank you. <laughs> Question number three. The home ownership rate in Brockton is significantly lower than the rest of Plymouth County. And more than 50% of Brockton renters pay more than 35% of their income for their rental. To afford a two-bedroom in Brockton, the average renter must work two and a half full-time jobs. This is unsustainable. And this is a part of the process of gentrification and displacement in our city. How will you address the Massachusetts housing crisis, which is hitting Brockton worse than most, most, worse than most other Commonwealth cities? Thank you. Uh, basically, I'm from Cambridge to Brockton. I understand their pain. And uh, there's two ways we could try to resolve that issue. And I'm thinking my way. First of all, District 11 is the most neglected. I'm telling you, the most neglected since I've been here 30 years ago. I've never seen anybody do anything for that district at all. Until now, I see people start running. They want to help. I don't know, they want to rent, but they've never done anything. Some folks are city councillors, nothing's done. I've been there, I've been doing things for Brockton and that district. I've been living in Ward 7 for 24 years and moved 24 years in Ward 2 as a businessman myself in Pleasant Street, right there in Pleasant Street. I invest. If you see Pleasant Street change a little bit now, a little bit, not much, it's because of me. I never seen any city councillors since they've been here doing anything. My, my way of thinking and doing it, when I get elected, I will make sure, because those folks need a break as well, like everybody else. I will make sure we bring good paying job, because we could afford to bring some good paying job for those folks to, to, to be able to afford those, those housing. We cannot chase them out. The second way to do that, you try to bring more housing into Brockton, more affordable housing into Brockton. That will reduce the price, the high price that we are paying right now. If we don't do that, of course, they're going to have to be going away somewhere else. Myself, when I used to live in Cambridge, Cambridge was too high. So that's why I moved to Brockton. And I make some changes. So far, I'm doing great. Thanks to Brockton and to, thanks to the people who helped me out because they chased me out from Cambridge, now I'm doing better. Thank you. Thank you, Brockton. Thank you again. We need to develop a pool of investors into the city of Brockton. 
one of the ways to have done that was to change the law regarding this credit union in this bank, which could lend to more minorities. In the church here, the state has a law that doesn't allow us to invest or put city money in. The biggest pool of money in Brockton, it is not a wealthy community, would be the city. So by changing the law, you would be able to then have the local people that would know more people on the Messiah board to lend to the minority community. But that must be done through legislation because of the restrictions that are placed on city money. Furthermore, we need to review the foreclosure laws to keep people in their homes. This state doesn't have judicial review. You have to sue after the fact. In other states, it needs a judge's approval to foreclose. We are going to go into it with the higher interest rates rising. We are going to go in with people having very difficult times paying their mortgage, their home heating uh, bills, and their food bills, because they're all rising, coming up. We need to look at those options now, not react to the situation. That isn't been done. So the thing that should be done is that the law gets changed so that the city could invest money into the credit union here, uh, and then the board can lend out more money to, they would know more, signified by minority people that would be looking for investments, and we need to develop a pool. Uh, Brockton is not known to be business friendly. Uh, Chase Bank uh, has not opened any branches in Brockton yet. And when I met with the regional guy today, he told me it's highly unlikely because of the regulations that they have to go through. And I thank you uh, for the time. Um, I would just like to say that uh, downtown Brockton, with all the housing that we've built over the last uh, four or five years since uh, Bill Carpenter was here, was due to uh, state funding which was a HDIP program. And the, uh, the uh, program is now in the economic development package, which uh, hopefully we're gonna uh, uh, do within the next few weeks. Uh, the train is a huge asset. It's a gem for, for Brockton, because all you have to do is just go right across the street, right into uh, Boston for the uh, high paying jobs and uh, come back here to Brockton. Uh, with the new administration, I can work with her team uh, to make, sh make sure the gentrification uh, is taken care of. Um, you know, Senator Brady and I have worked with the Brockton Housing Authority, Camp Ello High Rise. Uh, they're, they're building a new uh, facility uh, down there, taking the old one down, and uh, with our uh, advocacy, we uh, got it passed a couple weeks ago and um, a few other uh, big things. But uh, I just want to say that uh, Angel Cosme, thank you. A couple of years ago, we worked on uh, the same, same issue, and I'll continue working with you. Thank you. Housing is um, a big concern, and I'm not um, waiting until January to really start doing something about it. When um, the state house, the housing committee, they had hearings on lifting the ban on rent control, I was there speaking in favor of that. So I'm already starting um, to work in trying to allow local communities to have more tools in their toolbox to do what is right for that community. And that would allow local officials to decide what to do. But at least it relieves um, the burden and sends it back to the communities. So that's one way. Another thing that it's happening too is um, kids, they're having to move out of the city, going to another school district in order to, um, because their parents can no longer afford to live in the city. Can you imagine the trauma that child and the impact it has in that child's education and what that could happen? I know what it felt like. I had to move from Brazil to start education here in the United States without speaking the language. So that is um, very concerning and it's happening. Also elderly, they helped build up the city, they helped build up the community, and now they're being pushed out of their community that they helped build. How is that even moral? So we need affordable uh, 55 plus homes, communities, in the city of Brockton. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. It's definitely uh, not an easy answer that we'll be able to provide in two minutes, but it's a collaboration among all of us. So this is the starting point for the conversations, and then together we can do 
a lot more. We can propose legislations, propose incentives. The homeownership try to increase that by allowing tenants to have a right of first refusal and also providing grants so they can afford to put down payments in their homes and stay in their homes when the landlords decide to sell. They don't have to be displaced and not knowing where to go. I'm a real estate broker and I've done this for since out of high school, so thank you. <laughs> Question number four, as a state representative representing Brockton that has a large immigrant and undocumented community, how would you advocate for immigrants' rights? Well, thank you again. But I would love you to switch a little bit, you know, start from the other side. I don't want to change the rules, you know. I would love, you know. <laughs> but I would, be, I would be nice, I know. Big bounce it up, you know. All right. <laughs> All right, so I'm an immigrant myself. I'm from Haiti, came here 18 years old. I was supposed to be a doctor, you know, replacing my dad. Unfortunately, I become a mechanical engineer, get involved in politics, trying to change the world. It's not my job, but I think the world need help, Brockton need help, that's why I get involved. So. There's so many words people saying. When some folks tell you they're gonna do this, they're gonna do that, but what have they done since they are here? You have to pay attention. I could say I could bring God down, but did, the, did I ever bring like even a saint down? No, so pay attention. Words, it's words. See the action sometime. See the action. So basically I'm not a city councilor so far. Without being a city councillor, you know, I've been doing a lot for Brockton. So when I get elected, I could do much more for that district who deserve much better than what I see right now. I'm upset about what's going on because that's why I'm still involved. Because Brockton deserve better. There's a lack of leadership in this city and some folks have to take action and change it. It's not words. I could give you all the nice words, oh, this, that, that. But what have they done? Thank you, already. That's what I could say. Thank you. Well, the 9th Plymouth District is made up of about 80 percent white, and it does not have a large immigrant population in it. It has a very small immigrant population. It is made up of a district that Governor Baker took 75 percent. It's neither Republican nor Democrat. It is a majority of 66% unenrolled voters, means that they don't affiliate with either political party. I will do what the voters in that district want me to do. You have to take the entire district and make, you know, balance it out as to what they want done. I think you represent the people, you don't represent your own views. We all have biases, but that's what I think. It's a district that has changed drastically. It's a district that is not Brockton-based. It is really an Eastern-based seat now. It is 36% of the vote comes out of the town of Easton. So, I mean, it's different. Uh, Brockton's a very small part of that district. So I would look to the community leaders in all those towns to see what they wanted to do. Do I believe that for immigrants, the best way is to get a good quality education? It changes where you go in life. It opens doors. And I think that the Brockton School uh, Department, which was one of the best in the country at one point, is not very good anymore. It is down, and according to Boston Magazine, right second to the bottom. People of color should do in the city should demand, because it's a majority, that the school department get up to snuff. They should demand that there be extra test scores to rise their test scores so they can get in better schools and achieve full employment when they want to get out. My time is up. I always go over, and I'm sorry. Just one comment. I, I was uh, born and raised here in the city of Brockton. I'm a uh, Brockton High grad. My, my wife is a Brockton High grad. My kids are Brockton High grads. I think Brockton High is doing very well. I love Brockton High School. Um, 
As, as, as the, uh, the state representative from the last six years uh, being the minority majority uh, seat, I think if you look at my record, just go on, on the uh, website, look at my record, and I think it stands for itself. Dan Gilbard, I think you can uh, attest to that. Um, so with that being said, I think everybody deserves a little respect. Thank you so much for that question. I happen to be an immigration attorney, so this is what I chose to do for um, a living. I have extra normal student loans, and um, I went to something to really provide that public service because I, I truly believe that the community and people uh, need someone who truly cares, and that's why it compelled me to uh, go to law school. And um, immigration rights is human rights. That, that's all I can say about that. And um, all we're seeing, what is happening to the people that are just being um, shipped off to the islands and the way they've been treated, misled, uh, it's, it's just not wrong. Those are the types of cases that we do and um, we provide resources for them and help them get a green card through uh, the U visa because they were victims of a crime. Being in the United States without legal status is not a crime but people are trying to criminalize them and, and treat them as criminals. It's not, they're not in, in criminal court, they're in civil court, so people need to understand that. What we can do at this point is really vote yes to keep uh, the driver's license as a law. And um, now on the ballot, so make sure you do that. It's so important because that's the way that they criminalize people. They've been pulled over, they're going to court during the Trump eras, even by showing up to court. They were being detained by ICE at the courthouse. So that happened. We would have to go as attorneys, kind of walk around, make sure ICE was not there before we were let our clients in because they were targeting people just by that fact. So there's a lot of things that are happening. We can definitely do more, and this is obviously a passion. So it's uh, close to my heart, and I'm looking forward to continue to doing that work in the um, state level and providing uh, resources, information, know your rights, a lot of things that we can do for our community here in Brockton. Um, thank you. I have one, I have time for one more question, and so we're gonna spice it up for Mr. Fred Fontaine, and I'm gonna start to my left, okay? Wanna please everybody, okay? Question number five. If elected, how would you improve the criminal justice system in Massachusetts, starting with Rita Menez? Thank you for that question. Really, thank you for having us here tonight. It was a pleasure, it was an honor. Definitely, we're gonna be out there to answer more questions and looking forward to hear from the other candidates. The um, legal system, that is something also um, very concerning. We have a lot of people in our jails today that should have been in a mental health facility. So we really need to make sure we're providing resources for the people, making sure that they're able to make phone calls to their family members without the concern that they don't have the money to reach out to their own family members, added on to that mental health um, the, that they have. And also another thing that we need to get rid is for nonviolent the cash bail system. If you take two defendants, exactly same charges, exact same situation, exact same set of facts, just the fact that one was able to pay bail, get out of jail, show up in a nice suit and tie, show up and say that they've been rehabilitated, they've been back in the community, they've been back in churches, they're good members of society, will give two very different outcomes, but just the fact that one was detained that whole time and the other had a chance to come out and make something different out of it. How is that even uh, fair and moral? We definitely need to look at that. There's a lot of things that we can do, and I'm looking forward to working with the different DA that shares the same visions and we'll be able to work with us on that. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, a couple of years ago, we did uh, uh, um, criminal justice reform, and Claire Cronin, she was the, uh, the uh, chair of judiciary at the time, and, uh, and the present uh, chair of judiciary, Mike Day from uh, Stonia, 
uh, we filed a bail reform uh, bill uh, that was part of the overall uh, all bill, and uh, which we passed uh, uh, overwhelmingly. Um, so I can work with uh, anybody as far as the the uh, judicial system. It's uh, just talking to uh, each and every uh, uh, you know a good attorney like our, like Rita, you know, getting her insight and uh, uh, everybody else. So uh, that's where uh, you know we can work on. Well, I disagree with them. I believe that the federal system is biased. And you see, we are supposed to be a democracy. We have 25% of the world's population, jail population, resides in the United States. We have more people in jail than China or Russia. That is a disgrace. We are supposed to be a democracy. There is no democratic thing. Federal courts, judges, I answer a vote to nobody. There should be put in that system a judicial review board that you can file a complaint when a judge is biased. Furthermore, the bail statute should be reviewed at the, the level when it's a nonviolent crime, you're presumed in this society to be innocent. That isn't the case. And I will say this, and I did many a case in federal court and state court, there is a bias against people of color. You can see and get a different opinion from three judges. That shouldn't be allowed. It is never going to probably change because there's bias in every human being. But you can go to courts and get three different opinions from this on the same issue with the same defendant. Minority members, and if they ever did any study, would show that they get harsher sentences in any great length. You're never going to probably regulate that out because of the bias. But at the level that there should be another review board when a judge oversteps his bound. And not just to, they whitewash everything. They don't do anything. The legislature has an obligation to oversee the state courts. They should oversee them. In these minor offenses where they hold somebody on bail, instead of letting, holding somebody on bail, they try to commit murder. That is it. Uh, my time is up, and I'm sorry I'm going too long. <laughs> I think um, he said it right. You know, I think uh, the system needs to be uh, fixed. You know? I mean, uh, it's not a Republican or Democrat thing. It's a fact. You know, I mean, I think we, you know, the black folks have been uh, really been neglected in, this, in many parts of the city here, not only this city, everyone you know, around the United States. There's some folks who's been neglected and been mistreated. And uh, I think we have to try to do the best to help those folks over. Because like, uh, of course, Mr. Hall is running. I think he's a great man. Uh, we need some representation in the black community to help those folks to understand that uh, time are changing. We have to help people out because we are all in the same boat. If we don't help the others, things are going to be worse every day and every day. Again, it's not a Republican or a Democratic thing. It's a Brocktonian thing right now, since I'm fighting for Brockton. This is a Brocktonian thing. District 11 especially need help. And when I get there, I will make sure I work with some colleagues. Since uh, Mr. G already think, you know, Rita made it, you know, I don't think so. I'm going to make it. So <laughs> I make sure when I get there, I'm going to get your help, folks. It's going to be a work for everybody here. It's not only one Mr. Brady or him, whoever gets elected. It's not going to be Mr. So and so. It's going to be a work for everybody in this city. The church, the kids, the black, the white, city hall, everybody. City councilors, it's going to be everybody work it out. Again, thank you. I think we could do better than that. Brockton deserves the best. We get a beautiful city. We could make it happen. And I believe in that. Thank you. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your responses. Now I'm going to ask Maria. She's going to facilitate the uh, state Senate candidate uh, questions. Thank you. I 
just would like to um, remind everybody, can we keep the applause to the end? Only because we, you know, we have a time issue. Um, all the candidates are allowed two minutes and, you know, between the applause, they have to wait until you stop applying to um, answer the questions. Now, before I start with the questions for the state senator, I would like to read the description. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Yes? Yes. Thank you. Uh, state senators make up what is called an upper house of the Massachusetts le legislature. Like state representatives, they too are elected by communities to serve in the Capitol. They share similar, many similar responsibilities such as writing laws, passing budgets, these laws and funds relate to the same services state representatives work on. One key difference between the state senators and the state representative is that they represent different amounts of people in different size areas of the Commonwealth. Typically, state senators would represent about 169,000, and the state representative would represent approximately 40,000. This means that they have more proportional power and a greater responsibility in terms of their constituents, the amount of people they represent. Both the State House and State Senate vote on bills and budgets that they collectively influence. And now we're gonna go into the questions. Um, as you may notice uh, when I start asking the questions, because of the similar similarity, these questions are the same. So question number one. Um, what are your top three priorities as senator going into the state house? Uh, we're gonna start with Senator Brady. Thank you. And thank you to the Brock Municipal Committee for hosting this. I've been here for many, many of the time. Check, okay, now you can have <laughs> I'm going to start again. Thank you to the Brockton Interfaith Community for hosting this. I've been involved with many different initiatives supporting Brockton Interfaith Community for many, many years when I was a lot there on the school committee and as a city council and a state legislature. So the top three priorities, the number one is funding. And I've worked diligently over my years serving in the state level and the local level to get adequate funding for our district. I represent a very diverse community and a very diverse district and funding is number one. And we worked with Representative Cassidy and several other legislators to get the highest increase of funding for our district in the history of the Commonwealth to help out the communities that we represent. The second thing, and not much less important and right on level with funding is education. And we've worked diligently way back with Vic to get 90% reimbursement to build five elementary schools in the city of Brockton with 90% reimbursement from the state. I've been a big supporter of after school programs. I've been a big supporter of early childhood learning, full day kindergarten with BIC, and also ESL English as a second language in the Adult Learning Center. And we passed the Student Opportunity Act, working with our colleagues to get the highest increase of funding for education in the Commonwealth, especially for the city of Brockton. And the other thing is housing. And again, big need. I get calls every day, people looking for apartments, people looking for houses. We have funded an increased housing development in the city of Brockton in some of the towns I represent as well. You can see downtown some of the old factories that we had that were vacant for many, many years. We worked with the state and the federal government to get adequate funding to refurbish some of these buildings, condominiums in downtown, apartments and affordable, and we are continuing to get more funding for housing for the city of Brockton. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you to the Brockton Interfaith Community for hosting this. This is my first time ever doing this. I'm a school teacher. I'm not a politician, but I have, I got into this for a variety of reasons. The number one reason why I got into this was because of a comment that was made that I had a conversation with um, a young girl who was doing her student teaching at a local school right here, near, nearby us. And she was teaching in an elementary, elementary classroom. And one of her students asked her why she needed to go to school in the first place. Because she was only going to do what her mother did and stayed home and collected a check. And that haunts me. 
as a school teacher, that haunts me. So I felt the need to jump in and try to do something. And I want to be a voice for that young girl at, at, the, at that school. And one of the things that came to me is what we need here in Brockton, and, and I'll preface this by saying I don't live in Brockton, but we need more vocational opportunities in Brockton. I would advocate to get a vocational education high school in Brockton to start with Brockton students. And that, that young person at that elementary school told me, her comment told me that she had no hope and she had no opportunity. Well, I want to provide hope and opportunity for that young girl and give them the opportunity and give the inner city kids an opportunity to learn how to be a carpenter or a plumber or a hairdresser or a chef. Now they have some hope and opportunity. The other things that are concerning to me is the epidemic of fentanyl that's going on, not just in Brockton, but in our communities. And I, and I watched a video within the last week or so of a law enforcement agent on the West Coast who just came near fentanyl and overdosed on it just by breathing it in. And we need to support our law enforcement agents and fund them so they can properly handle this and properly train and go out into the community and educate and get into the schools because everything starts with the young folks. Thank, Thank you. you. Now to our second question. Uh, we know that at the state, state House, you wouldn't be the only person voting on legislation. If you want to get your priorities passed, what would you do to organize your colleagues together? Thank you again for that question. And um, you know, it takes a lot of experience in working with colleagues and teamwork. I want to thank all the candidates running tonight, whether you're a first time candidate or been in office for several years, but it takes a lot of time to build up relationships with people. And I'm very fortunate. Tommy Kennedy opened doors for me when I first got into the state house, and Jerry Cassie, our representative, he worked for Tommy Kennedy. He opened doors. So he already introduced me to many people, but on my years of experience working on the school committee, when I worked with the state delegation to bring funding for Brockton, working on the city council, and I serve in the Ways and Means Committee. That didn't happen overnight. You have to build up relationships with your colleagues in the state house. Doesn't mean we agree with everything, because I work for my district, that's a priority, but you have to work as a team to get things done. And I'm fortunate, I serve in the chairman of the Public Service Committee, I serve in the Veterans Committee, I'm very conscious of veterans issues, but the chairman of Ways and Means allows me to get things done and working with the leadership in the state senate and the colleagues in the house because a bill may start in one branch of government but you have to get a pass in the other branch of government and then the governor and sometimes we have to override vetoes of the governor because there's important issues for the Brockton community and the other districts I represent so experience counts working with your colleagues building up relationships and working as a team that's how you get things done and I'm very fortunate of all the experience I've had working locally in local government and in the state house to work together to get things done for our district. Uh, all the candidates have talked about creating relationships and building relationships, and that couldn't be that could that's the, the main goal. In the state senate right now, there are 40 state senators, there's 37 Democrats, and there's only three Republicans. We are way out of balance, and we need to bring balance back. But that said, it is about building relationships. It is about um, doing what's best on both sides of the aisle. As a teacher, my main job is to listen, to listen to my students, to hear what they have to say, to, to understand where they're coming from, because they all come in from different, uh, different backgrounds, different homes, different environments. So to be aware of what their needs are. And the old, the old line that my mother used to say is, you're never wrong when you do the right thing. And what's, what's do, what we do right is we do right for the citizens of this district and do right for the citizens of Massachusetts. And it's about creating dialogue. It's about listening. It's about um, being open to suggestion and to compromise. And my goal with any piece of legislation that I either hear or I put forward is to create relationships and personal connections with everyone that I'm going to be working with. Thank you. And if possible, we can hold the applause to the end, please. Thank you. 
The home ownership rate in Brockton is significantly lower than the rest of the Plymouth County, and more than 50% of Brockton renters pay more than 35% of their income for their rent. To afford a two-bedroom in Brockton, the average renter must work two and a half full-time jobs. I know, because I work it. This is unsustainable, and this is part of the process of gentrification and displacement in our city. How will you address the Massachusetts housing crisis, which is hitting Brockton worse than most other Commonwealth cities? Thank you. This is a big, important issue we've been working on, and we passed legislation for a Closer Protection Act to help people that were in jeopardy of losing their homes in Brockton. We also passed legislation for first-time down payment assistance for people that want to buy a home to get help financially on a down payment on a house. We also, I've worked with Neighbor Works and Mass Housing and Partnerships. That's why we are working with our state delegation and our representative Cassie to create more housing in Brockton more adequate and safe housing in Brockton in the surrounding towns that it represent. Some of the other towns, Whitman, Hanson, they are developing housing as well. Fair, adequate workforce development housing. But these important issues, we passed legisl legislation to protect homeowners so they can stay in their homes, so they have foreclosure protection, as well as first down, down payment assistance for these residents. And even for the renters to protect them because they are working families. Another big important thing is increasing wages fair share wages and prevailing wages, because if people are making a de decent living, they can afford to pay the mortgage on a home. And we pass legislation for, to protect our health care workers, our teachers, that's why I've been endorsed by the Mass Teachers Association, the Boston teachers and the American Federation teachers. Our educators need to pay, be paid a fair and equitable wage. So if we increase the wages for the working class people that we represent, that helps them to be able to afford a home as well. Um, as far as the, uh, the home uh, housing issue is concerned, I would advocate for um, Chapter 40B, um, and I just learned about Chapter 40B uh, recently. Um, it's a state's affordable housing law, and the law was enacted with the goal of making at least 10% of a community's, um, every community's home, ho housing affordable. And the process is available to develop at least 20 to 25% of units whether, and to be um, tabbed as low or moderate income for lower moderate income families and these homes are located in developments across the state including single homes condominiums uh, townhouses duplexes and but there is some criteria involved here um, they have to have uh, there's a financial criteria there some have to, uh, criteria is some income and assets have to fall below certain limits uh, they have to be first-time home buyers and that home has to be their primary residence now there are income limits if a, a, a family of a, just a single person can get into a 40B home with a, with a maximum uh, income of $56,800, a family of five could get into a 40B home with, an av with a, uh, under $87,600. Now, my wife and I lived in an area um, outside of, um, we just moved from, to, to Hanson, but in the, in the um, previous town that we lived in, there was a 40B development put, put in nearby us. There were 57 homes put in, and 14 of them were labeled as, uh, titled as uh, 40B, that allowed low-income families to be able to purchase those homes. And that's what I would certainly advocate for at this point. Thank you. As a state represent, uh, as a state senator representing Brockton, that has a large immigrant and undocumented community. How would you advocate for immigrant rights? Well, I'm very honored. I've worked and lived in a very diverse community. I still live in the same neighborhood I grew up in, which is only a couple blocks from here. I've worked very diligently with our federal delegation because immigration is both a federal issue and a local issue. And I've built up a good relationship with Congressman Lynch, Senator Markey, and Senator Warren to help advocate. I get calls every day for people that they're here legally, they're not here illegally with visas, and they're on a waiting list to get their citizenship, and we've called our federal delegation to expedite the process and help them get their citizenship. In workers' rights as well, and I work with the local, we got money for Haitian immigrants and 
in Cape Verdean immigrants. We have a new facility. We just opened up a cross street on Legion Parkway. And we also had a groundbreaking in Mattapan on uh, Blue Hill Avenue to open up to help immigrants with issues. It's still not enough, though. We have to obviously do more, but that's a starting point in funding to get immigrants proper education, because that's going to help them get accoladed into the society, get a good paying job. I've been a big supporter, as I mentioned, at the Payne schools uh, at their graduations to help the Adult Learning Center and the ESL program, English as a Second Language, and help them to get adequate ways to get to work, like was mentioned earlier, you know, transportation, the train, public transportation, in helping legal residents get their license. And there was a big bill that we voted for and passed. There's a ballot question coming up, and this is a legal process to get people their license. They have to go through proper training. They have to get insurance, so it protects people from getting an accident that may not have a license to run from an accident. It's going to protect people's safety, and it's been supported by many police organizations in there's several other states outside of Massachusetts that have supported this. So that's just a start, but it all comes back to getting more revenue and training for our immigrant population so they can come become contributors to our society. And I'm very honored of the work I've done with my constituents. The immigration process is, is lengthy and it's very time consuming. And with the influx of immigrants that have come, come, come to this country over the last few years, uh, there, even with no backlog, the time frame for, uh, the, to, for an immigrant to go through that process is anywhere from one and a half to three years. And I feel with the, uh, with the influx of immigrants that have, co have come in, I would advocate, and, and again, it's, it's, it, it, it's state and federal, I would advocate to, to um, put forth a fast track uh, system to speed up that processing time so the immig immig immigrants that are coming through can get through instead of waiting and waiting and just and, and kind of twisting in the wind for, for a, a long period of time. Another thing that comes up is that the, that the federal government has a diversity um, visa lottery program, which each year they um, grant 50,000 uh, visas, uh, green card visas, um, in a lottery system. I actually know somebody who won the lottery and got, a, got his green card. 50,000, I think what I would advocate for is to increase that number um, for, for all immigrants. Um, I would argue that it would be extended to include immigrants that, that came here legally and that however they got here, that they should be all, also be included in that as well. Thank you. We're at question number five. If elected, how would you improve the criminal justice system in Massachusetts? Well, I want to advocate and mention, as Representative Cassidy mentioned, we passed a huge criminal justice reform bill, and it was the largest reform in the history of the Commonwealth. And I know uh, former Chairwoman Claire Cronin, who's now an ambassador, she was the chairwoman of the Judiciary Committee. That took a lot of effort and didn't take overnight to get passed. It was a lot of work, but I'll tell you, it helps the most vulnerable families out there. It has helped youth, and it helps stop repeat offenders because the system is, has been broken for years, and this criminal justice reform bill is going to help so we can alleviate and stop these repeat offenders. And that's another thing we have to do is get these individuals that they're not, I'm not talking about hardened criminals that murder somebody, I'm talking about uh, miscellaneous crimes at, this, at the Plymouth House Corruption. I've worked with them at Mastery Community College when they're going to get out so they can get adequate work and jobs and training. And if you get somebody a good, decent job, they're gonna, it, it would lessen them to be in a repeat offender to go back to jail several times over. So this criminal justice reform bill was a start, but we are still continuing to do more. Thank you. Uh, yes. uh, we have um, a serious opioid crisis and human trafficking in our area, and it's just not in Brockton, it's in the, and not just in the bigger cities. It's in the small towns, it's in Whitman, it's in Hanson. Now is not the time to be soft on crime or soft on um, criminal consequences. Um, education and understanding criminal ramifications is utmost. And again, being a teacher, I start at the, te at the ground level with the young kids. We teach them. The goal is to educate the young generations by going into the schools and bringing positive 
building positive relationships and being visible in the community. It's more about being proactive so we're not seeing re uh, repeat offenders going into a broken system. Um, it's creating hope and opportunity, creating jobs, creating the av avenue for these folks that, uh, that have committed crimes and have done their time to start again. We all get a fresh start. Every day is a new beginning. And we have to give those folks who have done those crimes the opportunity to right themselves. And it's all about being proactive and keeping um, the, the eye on the prize. And we know that the system is broken and it's a big thing to fix. I have a daughter who works in the, in the, in the courthouse and she's only been there for a very short time and I had lunch with her maybe a week or so ago and she was just had her head down and she goes, the system's broken and I don't know how to fix it. It's a big problem. But I think being proactive and getting, getting um, educating the young folks on the, going the right way will be a big start. Thank you. Uh, we have about three and a half minutes, but we can do one more question. Um, mental health is a critical yet unappreciated aspect of our personal and collective well-being. What can state legislatures do to improve the increased mental health services for Brockton residents? Well, this is another crucial issue, and during the COVID crisis, um, people were meeting virtually on TV screens or computer screens. That does not work. You need the one-on-one -on -one help or in group settings. We have some facilities in Brockton and the Commonwealth, but we recently passed some legislation to get more funding to have more adequate mental health facilities and funding to have properly trained workers at these facilities because you need proper oversight and you need to keep an eye on what's going on in these facilities. The years ago, they had hospitals in Taunton and other places, and they closed. And they end up kicking these people out in the street, and they weren't getting out. That's why we have a large homeless population. So proper oversight and adequate funding and training for our health care workers in the mental health fields. And drug addiction is a big issue with the opioid crisis, but there's people that have mental health issues who never touched an illegal substance in their life due to circumstance in life veterans who come back serving our country. I've supported the Welcome Home Bill, and we have a VA hospital that helps our veterans out in Brockton as well. And that's working with our federal delegation, because that's federally funded. But we work with them to get more funding at the state level for that, and we have to have more adequate safe housing. And as was mentioned over, there's another facility that just opened up, up in the Pearl Street area to help people with mental health. It's a brand new facility. It's going to be safe and secure, so it's safe for the neighbors. And it's also important that they have proper oversight and training so the workers who, who are working there have the proper training to deal with the people with mental health. And there's so many families that are suffering. And it's been like a hitting agenda because it's something that people were afraid to talk about. They, they were ashamed. And we have to communicate and get the word out about these facilities. Better communication is a key as well. Again, I'm going to go back to my teaching. Um, Mental health is a huge and mostly overlooked um, issue at every age group. And you would be alarmed at how many young folks. Now, I've been, I'm an elementary school teacher, and I've been in every grade from K to 7. And you would be alarmed at how many of those young folks are seeing therapists on a regular basis. And this is long before COVID. Um, but the mental health concerns are first and foremost. And um, I've talked to many school uh, teachers, administrators, as I've been going around walking and knocking on doors in, in, in the district over the summer. And um, the common number that they tell me is that there is one guidance counselor and one school psychologist for every 300 students. We need to close that gap and we need to um, reach out to them and we need to provide uh, funding for our schools to increase the, uh, the, the, the uh, mental health uh, professionals that are within the schools so we can identify who those folks are. So they don't, um, so. Um, Candidate Gordon, I have some thoughts. Here. Sure. That time is up. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you had your time. I apologize. Go ahead. Where was I? <laughs> um, so yeah, we need to be proactive with, these, with the, those folks 
who suffer from having mental health issues. And we need to be able to identify them and get them the help that they need before we have cataclysmic events at malls and, and schools. So we, we're ahead of the game, and we're doing what we, we can to, to help them before a crisis. And then we start Monday morning quarterbacking and pointing fingers at, why didn't we know about this ahead of time? Thank you. Thank you, Senator McGrady, and thank you, James Boyden. Um, now we'd like to invite Rashawn uh, Hall to come up. And I now would like to call George Angel to come up and the next set of questions for the district attorney. All right, everyone. I'm back. How's everybody doing? Good. Getting late into the night. We all hanging in there? Yeah. You got to stretch a little bit? Perfect. So I was actually supposed to introduce Candidate Hall, so we did it a little backwards, but welcome Candidate Hall. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. <laughs> to give everyone a description of what the role of the district attorney is, the district attorney is the government's prosecuting officer who charges and tries cases against individuals accused of crimes. Things like recommending lengths of time served, requesting mandatory minimum sentences, influencing what crimes get prioritized, and how the criminal justice system functions overall. All of these functions fall under the umbrella and jurisdiction of the district attorney. If you care about policing, public service, and public safety, you should care about this race. If you believe that the criminal justice system does or does not represent you, you should care about this race. If you believe that freedom and democracy are not just pretty sounding words and ideals, but something that we have to practice day in and day out, you should care about this race. With that being said, as we only have one of the candidates here, I will direct all my questions towards candidate Hall. Same rules apply, you have two minutes. I don't have four. <laughs> it's just me. Okay, fine. Question one. What, in your opinion, are your top three issues, policies and practices within the office of the DA that need to be amended, reformed, and eradicated, how would you prioritize them? Well, thank you very much, good evening everyone. Thank you to Bick and to Mount Messiah, stalwarts in this community for doing advocacy for racial justice and social justice. This is a very important conversation. Rasan Hall, I am a former prosecutor. I am a civil rights attorney and I'm an ordained reverend. I have fond memories of preaching here at Mount Messiah um, Baptist Church. It's a wonderful time. Those three priorities stem from this notion. My campaign is that I am running to reclaim the spirit of justice because we've seemed to lost sight of this issue of justice. There's been too many injustices in this system. And so what those priorities look like is creating an integrity review bureau that looks at every aspect of a case, not just claims of innocence for wrongful convictions, but looking at holding law enforcement accountable, but as well as the other practices within the office from the sentencing recommendations and other miscarriages of justice that happen. We want to have strong, robust policies and training that inform our prosecutors what they need to do. So if we're concerned about children or about victims of domestic and sexual violence or about the opioid crisis, we need to give our prosecutors clear direction 
and guidance and make sure that they're trained well. And lastly, we need to make sure that we are being intentional about collecting data. We cannot manage what we do not measure. And so when we think about the racial disparities in the criminal legal system, some folks have said that the system is broken, but depending on where you come from, you understand that the system is working the way that it was intended to. That is something that we need to be intentional about addressing, dismantling those disparities. And the only way that happens is we collect data, analyze data, and report that data and make it public to everyone. And my apologies in advance to the interpreters because I do speak fast with the two minutes, but if I would have had four, I would have taken more time. I'll be better. I got nervous. I thought you were talking to me. I was going to hit you with my English. Is nobody good looking? <laughs> Question number two. What is your opinion on holding law enforcement personnel accountable when they break the law? How would you hold them accountable? So as a member of law enforcement at the district attorney's office, we would hold ourselves to the same high standard that we would hold law enforcement. The way that we would go about that is through this Integrity Review Bureau that would not only look at the actions of the office, but also have an autonomous body that would look at and investigate claims of police misconduct. We would also create and have a public Brady list, which is a list that requires turning over or releasing information about exculpatory evidence. And so if there are officers who have been engaged in misconduct or other miscarriages of justice, that information is publicly available. This autonomous body would also have the ability to prosecute any officers who have violated the law. But not only that, we want to be proactive in engaging with law enforcement, making sure that they understand what the standards of the law are, making sure that they're understanding the outcomes that we're getting from the data that we are collecting and engaging directly with community. Folks who have direct impact or have direct and lived experience and know what it is like to be on the other side of police misconduct and police harassment, but also to engage with law enforcement to bring that perspective into the work that the district attorney's office does. And so that's how accountability happens with transparency and accountability and community engagement. Thank you. Question three. People of all races and ethnicities commit crimes at the same rate, yet 70% of all arrests in Brockton this year have been of black people. What do you see as your role in addressing racial inequity and injustice in the criminal justice system? How would you address it? So one of the things that came out of the 2018 criminal law reform bill that Representative Cassidy and uh, Senator Brady talked about, which I was an advocate for at the ACLU that pushed for those reforms, was the collection of data. And that's one of the ways that we're going to begin to address some of the racial disparities that exist in the system. And to the extent that anyone claims to have impacted the reductions in incarceration or the reductions in crime, those are a function of the criminal law reform bill of 2018 and the police reform bill of 2020, which most of the district attorneys opposed, but I as an advocate for the ACLU fought for. But when it comes to race and racial disparities, one of the things is having an office that looks like the communities that are being prosecuted. And so I would invest and commit to diversifying the office, particularly in the Brockton District Court. I would also be intentional about training the office so that they understand issues of race and racism and racial disparities and how that plays out throughout the criminal legal system. It's also important to continue to collect data. Again, we cannot manage what we do not measure. There's no way to just throw your hands up and say we get the disparities that society leaves on our doorstep without having done any analysis. Uh, as Councilor Mendez talked about the scenario where two different people for the same charge, same offense, are brought before court and one is released on bail and one is held on bail because one is poor. We need to analyze that. That is a significant driver of racial disparities. 
Another issue is creating greater amounts of diversion because there are too many low-level nonviolent offenses that ensnare too many people of color in this system. So the more that we are diverting them out of the system, which the evidence shows decreases the likelihood that they will return to court, is another way to address those disparities. Thank you. You cut it close on that one, thank you. <laughs> Question number four. When it comes to minors in the criminal justice system, what do you see that is working to support them? What do you see that needs improvement before and after they find themselves in the system? <laughs> well, when it comes to children, because that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about kids, y'all. It's important that we are increasing the opportunities for diversion. That is something that came out of that 2018 criminal law reform bill that I advocated for. We also raised the, the lower age of juvenile jurisdiction so that we're no longer prosecuting seven-year-olds in court, that we've raised that up to 12. But in addition to that, we need to increase the opportunities for diversion to keep young people out of the system and get them funneled into programming that's going to help them and increase, increase the likelihood that they don't recidivate or that they don't come back into the system. There also needs to be more training for the staff to understand the juvenile brain development and the impact that that has on criminogenic or antisocial behavior and developing best practices to make sure that we're getting better outcomes for our young people, for our children who are coming through this system. Again, I hearken back to data. There's diversion happening in the district attorney's office already. But the 2018 report from the auditor had significant questions about what was happening and the outcomes that were there because it couldn't be tracked because they weren't collecting the data and they weren't doing the analysis. We deserve better, justice demands better. And lastly, engaging the community, making sure that we are partnering with community-based programs that have our children's best interest at heart and making sure that they are creating more opportunities for them so that they do not get ensnared in this system and to the extent that they have touches with this system, that there is an opportunity for redemption and other community services that will keep them out of this system. Question number five. How do we rehabilitate first-time offenders before it leads to incarceration? So, oh, not done. oh. so last time What's I your didn't stance? get up on time, and this time I got up too early. Come on, man, work with me. What's your stance on alternative sentencing and plea bargaining? I can go now. <laughs> can you repeat the question? Sure. <laughs> question number five. How do we rehabilitate? How do we rehabilitate first-time offenders before it leads to incarceration? What's your stance on alternative sentencing and plea bargaining? So part of rehabilitation begins with reducing the footprint of the criminal legal system. It also includes having fewer people to go through the system in the first place. Massachusetts has the lowest incarceration rate in the country, admittedly. But if Massachusetts were its own nation, we would have the 11th highest incarceration rate in the world. So we shouldn't celebrate being the best of the worst. That said, if we reduce the number of people who are incarcerated, that increases the likelihood that we have fewer people recidivating. We also need to partner with and work with reentry programs like PAC Global. Brother Jamal Gooding has done great work with that organization, making sure that people who are coming out of the system have appropriate services and opportunities for housing and jobs and training to make sure that they are able to successfully reintegrate into society. Again, data collection and analysis. Let's make sure that the sentencing recommendations that we're giving are actually having positive outcomes in the lives of people instead of being tough on crime, which we have been proven does not work and there are reams of research and academic scholarship that shows it does not work. But then lastly, when it comes to plea negotiations, we shouldn't 
punish people for exercising their right for trial. We should make sure that we have consistent sentencing recommendations. We should not be leveraging minimum mandatory sentences or the threat of people being detained on bail as a way to leverage guilty pleas. There should be fairness and equity across the board in all of the sentences that we recommend and that analysis and that internal review board that is going to audit and look at the cases that we've prosecuted are going to make sure that there is more fairness and justice in the way we handle things. Looks like we have time for about two more questions. Incarceration and heavy fines don't truly rehabilitate people who commit crimes. They simply punish them. We need policy which reshapes current, the current criminal justice system structures and policies, including alternatives to incarceration. What policies currently exist that present alternatives to incarceration, and if elected, what are the, what are the type of things that you would change? So again, there is a diversion program that exists in the current district attorney's office, but it is shrouded in mystery. We don't know what type of outcomes it is creating or producing. I would be intentional about having transparency in that diversionary program and increasing the level of diversion because again, the research and the evidence and the scholarship shows that when people are diverted out of the system, particularly for first offenses or people with less lengthy records, that they're, when they're connected to programs and services, we're going to get better outcomes and have a safer community. I think investing in restorative justice programs where people are held to account in community and not just merely punished, there's a greater likelihood that they will not recidivate or come back into the system and that they'll be accountable in community instead of just sitting in a cell. Things that are the drivers of violence are fear, isolation, and shame. Yet when we punish people, we send them to a place that creates fear, isolation, and pain, and then expect different outcomes from the people when they come home. 96% of the people who are incarcerated are coming home one day. So we've got to be thoughtful and creative about working with community organizations and programs like PAC Global and some of the other programs that are doing restorative justice work and working with our young people who are gang involved or at risk but also people who are working with uh, individuals to make sure that they are not relapsing, that they're getting addiction services. And that's how we're going to really reduce the footprint uh, of this system. We're almost there. Please, let's keep it together. Seventh and final question. According to the Immigrant Defense Project and the Center for Constitutional Rights, the U.S. Immigration Custom Enforcement Agency known as ICE has, quote, a well-documented history of abuse and human rights violations, including medical neglect, forced family separation, solitary confinement, and psychological torture, end quote. We have seen troubling examples of such behavior from ICE at detention center facilities as well as through its operations both at the border and throughout our country. If elected Plymouth County District Attorney, would your office collaborate with ICE? And if so, what would your office's relationship with ICE look like? Well, somebody said defund ICE? I thought I heard that in the back. <laughs> Would there, there wouldn't be a relationship. We wouldn't collaborate with ICE. Full stop. What we would do is make sure that our prosecutors are properly trained and understand the collateral consequences of the criminal legal system for immigration. To make sure that when they are making decisions about sentencing recommendations, that they understand the full context of what's going to happen to someone. It's one thing for someone who has committed a violent and heinous crime to be held accountable, serve a sentence, and then be deported. But it's another thing for someone who was brought here as a child, got in a fight in high school, pled guilty, and then 20 years later be served with deportation orders and sent back to a country that they've never known. That is not anything that will be facilitated under my administration.
Thank you so much, Candidate Hall, for your thoughtful and sincere answers. We appreciate you making the time to speak with us about justice, democracy, and our civic duty to our home. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. For full transparency, the incumbent district attorney, Tim Cruz's campaign, his personal staff, and he was directly contacted and given ample notice about tonight. I want to reiterate that we are 501c3, we do not endorse candidates, and we do not have any type of bias. Now, that concludes the forum section of tonight's program. Thank you all. We made it. Now, whoa, 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 just that, just that section. Hold on, hold on, whoa. Hey. Well, I'm happy we stood up. I was actually going to ask you to get the jitter out. You know, there was a lot. All right. I'll take us into our closing, and then we can wrap. Is that good with everybody? Yes, sir. We're this close. As we all take a deep breath and remember the parts that we liked, the parts we didn't like, and most importantly, remember what was said. We want to remember how we felt tonight. As I take us into the closing final section of tonight's program, I wanted to thank you on behalf of the organizers of this event for your engagement in this collaborative effort. Thank you all for participating in your democracy. This room and this city are what democracy looks like. Today, you all and we as a collective decided to take the time to get more informed, to get clear on the conditions of our lives, and to listen to our neighbors, and to be the change we wish to be here, and we wish to see here in this city. But all the talking in the world won't save us unless we act. All this learning means nothing if we don't apply it. Democracy is not a spectator sport. To quote the legendary singer, songwriter, activist, Harry Belafonte, quote, anti-democracy is a virus that exists, and pro-democracy is the antibody to that virus. I think we all have to remain vigilant and stay on top of the issues of freedom, and democracy, end quote. We have four legislative actions we're taking on as a community, and we would like to invite you into your power, into making a change into your own city. Our first initiative is the ballot question number four. We'll be voting on this November called the Safer Roads Act. It is a statewide vote that would allow undocumented neighbors to attain driver's license. Do we believe that any and everyone willing to work hard and provide from their families should be allowed to drive to and from work? Yes. From the grocery store to pick up their children. If you don't think the people of Brockton should live in fear, please vote on question four. Second, we have the fair share amendment as question one on the statewide ballot that would direct taxes from anyone making over $1 million towards funding our public schools, repairing our infrastructure, especially our roads, and reducing the gap between those that have excess and give back to those that are barely surviving. If we believe in ending systemic inequality, if we believe in economic justice, and the once in a generation opportunity to make a statewide impact, please put your ballot where your heart is this November. We need you. Third, on a lighter note, I'd like to ask you all to join us as Brockton Interfaith, Inter Brockton Interfaith Community's immigration team will be holding an event October 20th where several of our elected officials are already confirmed to attend at the Pluff School. Come hang out with us. Please join us as one community with many layers 
colors, and cultures as we discuss what it means to come to Brockton and make it your home as well. And lastly, our final request is that you use your civil right as an American citizen to step into your power. Democracy is not just a God-given right that we see as self-evident. It is that and much more. Democracy is a practice for us to live by, to live in a world we know we deserve, but in order to get there, we have to build it with our own two hands. Hand in hand with our neighbors, our families, and our city, our people, our voice, nothing can stop us but us. If you want to get involved in any of these four initiatives, please see the table out front and get involved. And as we prepare to leave and connect with everyone about everything we've discussed tonight, I want to leave you with a parting quote and call to action. To quote the legendary historian, professor, author, and activist Howard Zinn, to be hopeful in bad times is not just a foolish, romantic endeavor. It is based on the fact that human history is not only that of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, and kindness. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many, where people have behaved magnificently, that's what gives us the energy to act. And at least the possibility of sending this spinning world into a different direction. We're almost done. <laughs> and if we do act, in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presence. And to live now as we think all human beings should, in defiance of all that is bad around us, that in and of itself is a marvelous victory. End quote. For this final piece, I want to ask all of your permission to bring my family into this space. Is that okay with you? Yes, sir. My mother is the same age as Ruby Bridges, the first person ever, the first black student ever, integrated into public schools here in the United States of America. My grandmother was raised in an era of legalized segregation, open racism, and a denial of her legal rights to represent herself through voting. My great-grandmother, or sorry, my great-grandmother could have never imagined a world, a time, or a place where I would be here with you. But here we are, together in this sacred place and in this sanctuary. My generation never had to fight for our right to vote because of the lifelong struggles of our parents, of their parents, their parents' parents, and their parents before them. We don't have to fear police dogs and fire hoses, but that does not make the matter any less dangerous, any less sacred, and any less urgent, just because time has passed. Things only change when we decide to make things change. Let the children of today tell the children of tomorrow that in this moment in history, we stood up together for our rights, here, together. Let us honor the sacrifices of those who came before us as we stand on the shoulders of giants. Our lives, our world, our city was all at one point a childish dream. Not just an American dream, but a desperate prayer from those all over the world who knew that better days were on the way. It is our great honor and our humblest of duties to exercise that right that so many have suffered for. Our vote, our right to vote, was earned through blood, sweat, and tears. We all owe those who fought for our collective right to vote a lifetime's worth of debts that can never be repaid. For as long as we live with the memories of those who came before, as we pass on those memories to those that come after us, you, all of you, 
are exactly who we've been waiting for. Thank you. And before we go officially, I see you sneaking. We have our elder brother, William, mentor, executive director, someone very special to me, who's going to take us out with the Song of Freedom. Someone who saw freedom in a place that needed hope, that needed support. We found Will, and now we have our way. <laughs>